I realized the two black <laughs> the gloves. Two black leather gloves. Yeah. Covered in blood Bloody and knife a knife. With hair. It's still a valid question. Who is the real killer? Uh, I don't know. They got away. Hit and run. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Oh, welcome to the Video Reformation Podcast. I'm Ben Oliver. I'm Justin Plant. We're the co-founders of Storyboard Media and your guides to practicing effective video for business. We're like the Uguay to your Po. Uguay. Kung Fu Panda. Oh, okay. We're um, we're on episode sixty something. Yeah. We're, we're I'm really yeah, scraping the bottom I'm of the barrel. Yeah, I know. I'm wondering what a hundred is going to be. Yeah. Are you saving something special? I think we'll probably just shift the bit by that point. Okay. Uh, or we may just refer to ourselves as an example of ourselves. <laughs> we're like the Ben and Justin, <laughs> but for B two B video. <laughs> uh, so our topic today is choosing the right location for your shoot. And maybe a little bit if you're considering or if you're regularly hosting shoots, mm -hmm. like you own the location. Sure. Kind of uh, some to tips to kind of be a, a good host also. Uh, before we jump in, I understand we, we have a new not fake sponsor this week. Right. It's Procrasta.Nation. Procrasta.Nation. Yeah. Okay. And uh, new SaaS service. They're coming out, uh, launching pretty soon, but we'll get to that in a little while. Yeah. They keep pushing back the launch date? Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, good. All right, well, let's jump in then. So, locations. Mm -hmm. Let's let's start with what, on a most basic level, what are our options for shooting locations? Broadly speaking, you can shoot in a studio uh, or on location, which means in a real practical environment. So uh, this would qualify as a studio? This is a studio because it's set up with you know, certain lighting rigs, and it has an intended purpose of just shooting. Everything's set up just so that the camera angles are correct. And if you saw this as one giant picture, you'd say, wow, this looks bad. <laughs> but then, well, you, I mean, you might say that otherwise. <laughs> that is them seeing it as one big picture. <laughs> no, I mean, but but they don't see this stuff over here, and the cords stuff. and whatever. So studios are made to look like Seinfeld's house or uh, apartment uh -huh. is a studio it's not a real on location no uh, i think he had a bedroom that's did, bigger than a studio apartment right oh i get it <laughs> oh, oh i get it um yes that's a studio so this is a studio uh we've also shot in multiple i, I think closer to what you would call sound stage type studios yeah. that are and depending on where you are, that may or may not be available to you. Um, could be in differing sizes, uh, I suppose. They come with different amenities, too. The one that we go to most often has this big, what they call cyclorama, just a giant wall that is typically white or green. It is absent of corners. It just mm -hmm. it looks like an infinity yes. white space. Uh, or, or others are just built as, like, giant warehouses without any... Um, Columns. Like columns. Uh, yeah. Just big, open, so tall, you can build huge spaces. sets. Yeah. Um, which you more often see in like Atlanta and Hollywood and even Wilmington a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I imagine some of the, when we get to what to look for in a location, some of these things are going to apply to both. I guess all of them probably apply to both places, but studios are typically designed with the intent of making sure that. You have control over all of the absolute that, control that, that you need to have. So let's talk a little bit about um, the on location type stuff, because that's where things get a little bit more tricky and you have to spend a little bit more time paying attention to, to know that you have, again, control over the things that we'll get to next. What, so just some some quick examples of on location shooting for us. A lot of times shooting B2B scenarios, we're either like uh, you know, lampooning an uh, a office cubicle farm type setup. So we'll find a an office that has cubicles in it and create scenes within that mm -hmm. that space. Um, or might you know we've shot at my house before. Yeah. For a project. Yep. Um, you know, basically anywhere that's not a studio is on location. Uh, yeah, I'm sure there's a more formal definition, but yeah, where you're kind of using what's in the space to your advantage is is then at least to me what i th think of when it's on location it could be something as simple as doing an interview in a conference room or mm -hmm. you know um right. you know whether you're 
hopefully you're not just doing it like up against the wall in a conference room, but maybe like out the windows or the the interviewee is at one end of the board table and the camera is at the other end just to create some, I don't know, something. So it could even be as simple as, you know, having to film your CEO or something for an interview or a quarterly mm-hmm. report or, or something like that. I guess that would fall into the on location. Sometimes you're not, yeah, you're not even necessarily making that, or at least some some producers are not making that deliberate decision of oh, we're going to go on location for this shoot. It's like, well, where's the CEO? What can we, right. you know, what can we get? Yeah. Um, funny thing about uh, studios and on location, just a, a funny little story. Um, the office, the show, mm-hmm. they were going through, I think this is in Rain Wilson's book. Um, they're going through auditions and it was screen test. And so they had all the actors there uh, at the studio and all, every studio at least the, the good big ones have producers' offices and stuff mm-hmm. in, in the back um, that are set up very much like just any other office. Uh, and so they were doing screen tests. They were, they were going to shoot all the actors in the studio, and the director said, no, we're going to the producer's office hmm. to shoot the auditions to do our screen tests, and it made everything come together more, a lot more. That's cool. Just kind of a cool story. Might <laughs> the reason you choose on location or a studio be motivated by your script or your creative treatment? Yeah, entire. I mean, that that is, to put yourself in an ideal situation, you will look at what, what is the creative, and usually a producer uh, will work with the, the director to determine what makes the most sense. What situations have you come across where maybe we've considered both in studio and on location options regardless of where we we may have ended up but in that kind of location scouting or early on in the creative process where maybe it's not defined can you recall any instances where we were either where it could have gone either way yeah like i'm i'm trying to think back on contract hound specifically or or convince your boss Mm-hmm. where we created these kind of abstract office environments in a studio because ultimately we decided to do it in this infinity white space mm-hmm. that the cyclorama gave us the opportunity to do. And I'm wondering, because I can't remember, if at any point we considered actual office settings for those. I don't think we did. We were a much smaller company at that point, and so constraints were... Uh, they're always an issue um, that's part of just the creative process. But um, I remember if, if we dec- if we were going to go into an office studio, there are still costs, but there are a lot more liabilities in terms of is it being used? Is it more expensive? Can mm-hmm. we get access to it, essentially? But if, if Can we afford extras so that it doesn't look like an empty but that, office? But that's the thing. So yeah. like set design and, and filling the space is really important. One way or another, you have to consider what the image, what the set Cause, is. Because I could see, you know, you think, oh well, and and we'll get to we'll get to where to source locations in a little bit. But imagine if you have a, a network connection that's in like the commercial real estate space, and he or she knows of a furnished office space that is vacant mm-hmm. because company went out of business or they moved and it's a sublease, but. Um, you may think, oh, great, well, this will give it an authentic look for an office and we don't have to, you know, build an entire cubicle mm-hmm. farm in a studio until you get there. And the heat's not on. <laughs> or it's empty. Or, yeah. The, but, like, but, like, devoid of people. Right. And you don't have the, you have the talent budget that you've spent on your four principal actors or whatever, but you don't have the budget for 30 extras that right. can fill up the other cubicles and walk around in the background and do all that stuff that... Yeah, unless, of course, that is the vibe you're going for, right? Some kind of zombie apocalypse or, you know, someone feeling isolated in their cubicle. Or everyone's out to lunch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the thing that gets me on, like, vacant office spaces is, well, how do you make it seem like it's not just a vacant office space and you have to put people back there? Unfortunately, or or go really, really tight and then you, you change the overall feeling of the of the piece of yeah. what you're trying to make yeah which if you were going really tight on something you could just as easily rent a cubicle and put it in a studio right yeah. and if as long as you're like staying in that cubicle yeah. then you might as well have the advantage and this this is i think a big point is that maybe i skirted around earlier is all of the things that you need to control are controllable in a studio they're built that way but on an 
on a location, you have to just work extra hard to, to have control over those things. So if it was something where you knew that the whole thing lived in one cubicle, then yeah, I, I would probably say, great, let's rent from some office furniture company one set of cubicle walls right? and put it in easier, the middle of a studio. It's easier to get <clears throat> that a cubicle in a studio than it is to get ladders, grip equipment, electrical, um, grids for lighting, all, yeah. all of that stuff into one space. Again, as mentioned, studios are predominantly built to have full control over these things. Mm -hmm. Whereas being on location, you have to put in the extra work to make sure you have. So you have control. So the first thing, of course, is... You need control over the light. Because if you're shooting a scene that takes place in a two-minute, in a real-world two-minute window, but you shoot it throughout the course of a day, the sun and the, the sun and the shadows were all, are all going to move throughout the day. You're going to break Speaking the lunch. Speaking of windows. Yeah. It, wait, what? You said if you have a, shooting a two-minute window. Oh, okay. Got it. <laughs> we're really in sync today. <laughs> yes, absolutely. The sun may move across the sky. Let's not actually talk about how it's the earth moving around the sun, because I imagine somebody sure. would want to comment that, but right, we get it. We get comments? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, so being able to yeah, either block out that window or use that as a motivation somehow throughout the piece. But like, Have you ever shot in a studio that had windows? <laughs> never. Uh, our, uh, actually, yes. <laughs> our, one of our studios had a window, which we just blacked out right. always. Yeah. You know, there are some spaces, especially when they're positioned as like photography studios that utilize like old warehouses. Yep. And they've got these shoot because with, with, you know, a single frame, frame, you can like that natural light, it's, the it's light great. from the sun, right? Yeah. It's, it's the largest single source that you have. So why not use natural light? What stinks is if you have to edit together mm -hmm. things and, um, Man, you may think you may even think that diffusing the windows would be enough. But if that's one of your primary light sources, if the sun goes behind a cloud, the amount of light that it's putting out, so you may not get like direct hard, you know, rays rays yeah. across or whatever. But if you go to edit from, you know, the A cam to then the primary angle, uh, and you know, two minutes passed in between and all of a sudden the sun went behind the clouds, that cut when you try to cut those two pieces together is not going to look right. right. Not right because of the amount of light, but also the color of the, of the light. Yeah. And the sun changes its color temperature throughout the day. Well, <laughs> again, not getting technical. <laughs> it's called golden hour for a reason. <laughs> yes. So morning and evening, yeah, yes. golden hour, golden. Yep. noon, blue. blue. Um, we're experts. That's why we hire experts. Um, there have also been times where we've shot in a space due to necessity, right? Sometimes it's it's client mandate that you shoot in our office or you shoot mm -hmm. in this area of our office that overlooks, you know, uh, the courtyard of this complex or something, and we whatever. I remember where as the as the sun moved throughout the day, asterisk. Um, it then started bouncing sunlight off of a red brick wall outside. Oh yeah, that yep. totally changed, right? So when it when that wall was in the shade, you weren't getting that red color. But then, of course, once the sun started hitting it, it starts bouncing more red light. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's it's a pain. So, in a studio, you don't really need to worry about that because there are no windows. There are no windows in the studio, or if there are, they're like made to be completely blacked out. So how do you compensate if you're on a location where you do need to either shoot through windows or near windows or like what are some of the options that you've got yeah. to either like judo it you, and use it to your advantage? You can, or, yeah, you can make it work. Um, you've got to be able to shoot within a tight, you know, shoot your entire piece within a very tight time frame so that you don't see a lot of those changes. You can use certain things like, um, like you said, diffusion and kind of, Almost, almost blur it out so that you mm -hmm. don't see the actual sun, but you just see brightness mm -hmm. as a as a more of a global source instead of a single uh, dot in the sky. You can use <clears throat> other things like neutral density filters and actually like essentially just paint the window with neutral density film and gain a couple or lose a couple stops of light. 
so to help. So at least it's with, not blown out with your dynamic range. You can get light on the subject, and it's not blown out in the background. Yeah. Although, in some cases, I'd just take blown out in the background because then if if the light changes outside, at least it's always blown out. <laughs> Suppose you could find a way to make that yeah, a I mean, creative choice. What we're getting at is even with this one. Uh, variable it's very difficult to shoot in a room with windows <laughs> yeah I, I think if i had to boil this down into like one actionable piece it's whether you're in a studio or on location black out all the windows however you can yep. as much as you can and control your light yep. as much as possible even if you want the effect of time passing use lights to do that change the color temperature to warmer as you get later in the script maybe even change the angle of the light a little bit to mimic the sun that's fine just get as much control over the light as you can right. so and if you another option if you have to shoot where there's a window but you need to control that that light you may put a huge flag up mm -hmm. outside yeah and then a single really high powered light to represent the sun coming yeah. through the blinds and yeah. then it it doesn't move yeah so I think we can, I, I want to turn some of these things into like tips for location scouting because had we gone by the order, right, we would have kind of led with the importance of scouting a location, whether it's a studio or an on location location, um, the importance of actually being able to physically walk through the space with as much of your crew as possible. The, the important, yeah, there's some very important ones. Yes, but with, with your electrical camera lighting audio audio um because those people like you said earlier those are the experts right who are going to see and hear things differently than even you might as a director producer whatever and so you can rely on their expertise to say hey we're going to want to make sure we block off those vents mm -hmm. or you know how much power do we have giving away the, the rest of the list but like so when you're on location First thing is look for that ability to control lights. It may not even be windows. It could be built-in ceiling lighting that, because of fire regulations, might always be on. Right. Like we shot in a grocery store yeah. over, overnight. Nobody was even there. We had control over the store. We had, but and, we, but... and we had very limited control over the lighting. Yeah. We couldn't go completely blackout on the lighting, which means we always had some of that dirty like green. yellowish greenish yeah. light that we had to overcome with then our color controllable lights so yeah it's it's not just the sun coming through the windows it's uh, okay that could be solved by an overnight shot well maybe there's a street lamp outside mm -hmm. that's going to throw off a really bright so blue led that's, light or that's an a orange. good point is if you're going to be shooting at five from five to ten scout sometime yes. in between five to ten yes yeah because there may be like another thing, sound, uh, which we can just jump into now. Like there may be traffic going by at that time, but n if you go visit at two o'clock, it's not busy at, with traffic. Yeah, and um, God, there's so much to sound. Um, we did a shoot. Um, you weren't actually on it. Um, we did a shoot where we had actually scouted the location. And what we heard was the HVAC. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing everybody thought was, where are the thermostats to control the HVAC? Mm -hmm. and, and this was in an office location, so not a designated studio. Um, and we identified all of the HVAC locations. What we learned on shoot day was three things to do with audio. One, the thermostats had no direct control over whether the fans were on or off anyway, mm. because even though we located all of the it, yeah. thermostats, we didn't do any testing to find out whether it actually turned the fans off. When the fans were off, there was uh, uh, it was on the top floor of a building. There was a compressor unit on the ceiling right above mm -hmm. one of our primary shooting locations that once the day started to warm up, was on all day. Mm -hmm. And there's no way to turn that off without getting up onto the roof and like pulling the power. Yeah. And oftentimes, 
no one that you're working with knows either how to get roof access yeah. or has the permission to do that. Right. Maybe if you're lucky and you're working with someone who actually owns the building, yeah, they could give you that. Act. But I, I mean, that would be something that I'd want to make sure beforehand. Was I, but because it was all the sounds were drowned out by the HVAC that was on during the scout, nobody heard it with the fans off mm -hmm. to then hear that there was this one compressor that we couldn't turn off anyway. Then when the HVAC was off due to it being a cooler day, right? And so even though we didn't have control over it, we lost the HVAC. It was quiet. Even when the compressor wasn't on earlier in the day, well, that just magnified all of the outside sound. Sure. There's no white noise. So there was no white noise blocking uh, the train yep. three quarters of a mile away. The playground away. next door. The playground. Yeah. The, uh, the construction site across the street where there were huge tractor trailers unloading industrial generators. Mm -hmm. uh, and the beep ups, you know, the reverse beeping sounds of trucks. Yeah, whatever can go wrong will... <laughs> probably it, go wrong it on location was, it was really frustrating for everyone especially the audio guy because you know the audio guy's standing there on just set shaking his head with <laughs> headphones on usually just looking at like the recording device and making sure none of the audio is peaking but then when you know you've got a problem when you hear something and you look up over at the audio guy and you see this yeah he's looking around <laughs> and you know if you can hear it without having all the mics feeding into your ears, you know the audio yeah. person's hearing it too. Yeah, more than likely. Um, and so it's that that balance between like letting your talent finish the take so that you're not interrupting them, but then saying, all right, let's take it again. We mm -hmm. had some. And those people, they got to do their job outside, right? Like the construction folks, they got to do their job. They're not going to yeah. stop for no. two hours. No. Well, I so, paid some so, people off before. <laughs> yes. So on location can get very expensive when you have people cutting lawns and <laughs> always take petty cash on location yeah. so that you can pay off the lawnmower yeah. or we had go we take had, a lunch. We had a team of two leaf blowers on that same location. Uh -huh. So once we finally had everything quiet, like day two of the shoot, then like 10 a.m. What is what is that? Mm -hmm. what, and, and then finally find a window and see. Two guys with gas-powered leaf flowers on their backs walking next to each other, blowing leaves off the sidewalk. We had a shoot years ago on UNC's campus where you paid a lawnmower mm -hmm. guy to stop working. We've even had shoots, one of the studios that we use, right. where you had to run out and pay a, a leaf flower, a lawnmower guy, or whatever to just like go do the other side of the building for a while yeah. or take an early lunch mm -hmm. or something like that. That's another thing is sometimes even studios – are near flight paths mm -hmm. and so sometimes even treated studios because everything is so quiet because they are so controlled maybe the only thing that can get through is an airplane going overhead mm -hmm. but there are still those moments another thing that i don't know how you you just kind of have to work around and this happens more in the more designated studios is that as the sun warms up the roof of the building it just starts to expand a little bit pop and, and, crack and there's and, occasional pops yeah. and cracks and you know there's only so much you can do if you find yourself in a completely soundproof environment uh that's gonna sound so dead anyway that you probably don't want to be in like an actual like soundless room you can go mad do you hear about that thing i think like microsoft built a room um that is completely void of sound they've got these like three foot deep sound panels mm -hmm. yeah it, apparently you can't be in there for more than like three minutes i think we've put this off long enough should we hear from our sponsor yeah yeah let me see from procrasti.nation and i'm sorry justin we are having some delays i will get this copy to you as soon as possible probably by end of day so hmm. um i guess we'll check in in a little bit yeah. Maybe at the end of the show. Yeah, just check in and see if they've sent us. Okay. I don't know what All right. we'll get, yeah, I'll what the delay could be <laughs> there. Uh, either way, our new sponsor, Procrasti.Nation. Uh, okay, so okay. we've hit on light. We've hit on sound. We could tell sure. stories all day about problems, but just know that you're going to run into issues with both of those if you're on location. I want this entire episode to be ba stories about <laughs> stories that we've uh, – right, I mean, that's – that's what so much of this is, is just drawing on experience. It's mm -hmm. not like... 
you well, know, it's not like I read four blog posts yesterday and yeah. said, oh, these are some horror stories or yeah. whatever. Like, it, like these things happen. We've had issues with every single one of these things on the list, which is why it's on the list. Yeah, and there's always something that comes up somewhere. Um, another one that, that I honestly don't know much about, but I know can be a concern, is access to power, mm-hmm. electrical power. Yep. Um, this is why you want your gaffer right your your or your electrician if you got a big enough crew to be on that location so that they can identify how much power they have access to where all the outlets are where the breakers are if they trip a breaker mm-hmm. do the outlets work do the outlets work are they on wall switches cuz you may you say like realize? oh perfect we'll shoot over here i see two outlets and then yeah you realize oh there's no power running to those there's an outlet in this room that I think is not connected. In our something. flawless I don't remember. Studio? Yeah, in our ugly studio over there. <laughs> I didn't call it ugly. Did I, I might have said I think, that. <laughs> I think you said ugly at one point. If they looked over I, there, they'd see I all that ugly stuff. I just saying, yeah, the camera angles hide crevices and Storage. Seams. Let's call that storage. Okay. Having sufficient power is less of an issue now mm-hmm. because LED lights are so predominant and pull so much less power than right. the old school tungsten lights. And there's a lot of battery options today. Uh, yeah. So it, it's... It's less of a concern, but if you're going to be properly lighting, and again, the studios are designed for exactly that. So in a studio, it may also be what kind of power options do you have up in the lighting grid? You wouldn't have a lighting grid on a location. Right. So you got to deal with wall outlets and things like that. Uh, Or if you're doing, I mean, if you're considering an outdoor location, you might have to figure out where to put a generator Mm -hmm. to run some power. And then you've got sound issues. And you've got sound issues. (laughs) I don't know how we did that campfire shoot. We had a long extension cord. A really long extension cord. Like, and then know, we, like... we, had, we had practical fire sounds because it was a, a, around a campfire, so that kind of hid mm-hmm. some of the humming. Yeah. I kind of bundled HVAC control into the sound and noise control. I, you know, it's also just worth touching on the HVAC issue for temperature because, mm-hmm. um, again, with LEDs, it's less so – but a lot of lights still do put out a lot of heat. And without being able to, I, all the studios that we work in have basically one area where you can just turn on or off the entire system. Mm-hmm. And you, you figure out after about one cycle that when you take a 10 minute break or a five minute break, somebody goes and turns on the AC mm-hmm. just to cool the room down again. Yep. And that's not just for like comfort, but your actors or your subjects Start yeah. to, they, so a lot of times interview subjects who aren't used to being on camera and in front of lights they sweat. start to sweat a lot. A lot. Some and, of them a lot. And uh, that doesn't make for a good video either. No, it's fucking freezing in here. Yeah, and I still manage to sweat. <laughs> What's another thing to look out for? Access. So how are you going to get you, yourself, your team, um, all of your equipment to that location? Yes, carts. Carts. All the carts with gear, <laughs> carts more carts. carts, more carts, different sized carts. Uh, yeah, so like, are the are there doors wide enough to get through? Can you? Is it? Is it? Are the doors tall enough to bring stands through? Um, are, you know, again, it's like ceiling. Can you even put your lights in here if the ceiling is hot, low enough? So low. We did a really small shoot in Dallas several years ago, where um, we were shooting in our clients' offices which was on, I don't know, 17th floor or something like that. And we couldn't, use, because it was a nice office tower, we couldn't use the main elevators for our gear. We, they sent us around to the freight elevators. But to use the freight elevators, they had to have a copy of our certificate of insurance. Mm-hmm. And so we got to the location on time, mm-hmm. didn't know that we couldn't use the regular elevators, got to the freight elevator they asked if our coi was on file Mm -hmm. we said what (laughs) we called who at that time was a our very good insurance agent broker whatever and she very quickly filled out the right information on our coi fortunately we had the coverage um that they needed and she got it to the company and so within 15 or 20 minutes of driving around the block in downtown Dallas <laughs> waiting to then be able to pull into the loading dock right cuz you couldn't just park and sit there yeah yeah so another thing yes another thing about access is where are your trucks going to park your equipment yeah. vans whatever you're taking 
where can they park so that you don't have to go three blocks away, park in a parking deck, drag six or seven mm-hmm. carts or bags or whatever it is that you have. Or, or where, where, can, where do you tell your talent to park so that they don't have to get up every two hours to go feed the meter? Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know that we've ever had that happen to us, but I imagine that would be very annoying as a director when a little beep goes off on your talent's Apple Watch and they've got to go feed their meter. Mm-hmm. I'll go send someone, I'll go send a PA to go feed your yeah. meter. Where's your car? Um, what kind of car do you have? Red? <laughs> red. I have a red what parking spot are you regional in? actor's car. <laughs> oh, Okay. <laughs> A Toyota Corolla. Me too. I, another thing to consider is once you get all of your people and all of your gear up there, again, this feels very much more of an on-location conversation than a studio conversation because studios are designed built, for this, Yep. is what are your staging areas? Mm-hmm. Right? How do you create the space for hair and makeup? Mm-hmm. How do you create the space to store the empty carts once all of the gear is off of the carts and on the stands and and whatever doing its job food like where's crafty yeah where are you all gonna sit to eat lunch like if you're working in let's just say a grocery store while it's open (laughs) sure and the public is there yeah the store has to make money yeah so all of the guests have to be able to shop yeah and therefore you can't shut down an aisle therefore you can't have a quiet aisle you can't have stands all over the aisle you can't have cameras and tripods all over the aisle You can't rearrange and stage things in an aisle because people need to find where the noodles are. Nope. So the entire back is refrigerated, so you can't hang out there. Right. Or or it's a break room for the staff. Yeah. And so luckily we (laughs) found a little spot that morning. Uh, But yeah, this is actually the only reason we primarily do B two B video, so we don't have to shoot in retail locations. Yeah. Now it is. Yes, you create your own story. And why why is staging important in a let's say an on location? Uh, work, let's say we're going to an office building to shoot a CEO in a investor relations video. Because usually in most offices you're going to be shooting in, there are going to be some employees there. Mm-hmm. I imagine this is where you were leading me. Yeah. Um, before the pandemic, there were employees in an yes, office building. Before, yes, and and so, but I you know I think that's. I think that's something we should touch on is so there are so many the percentage of vacant office space right now is so much higher than it has been and I don't necessarily mean like unrented space but there just aren't as many bodies in the office now mm-hmm. as used to be so there may be a company that has a skeleton crew or 50% of their employees working in the office and they can accommodate giving up half of their office for a shoot or something Mm -hmm. like that to be a location for anybody who's considering doing that with their office this film crew even if you feel like it's a small crew is going to take up about 10 times as much footprint as you think they are Mm -hmm. and so there's going to be an impact on the employees who are there whether it be the break room is taken over for cart storage and they can't eat their lunch in there or um they can't be as loud mm-hmm. as they can't they have a meeting are. in their usual they, meeting they spots they can't yeah. access these conference rooms can't draw on these day. windows right um so so it can be you know it's you get the, a lot of mean faces <laughs> you on as both a produ- sides right everybody's yeah. upset at everybody yes. because nobody can do their job yes and and so part of this too is just remembering for everybody to be civil <laughs> and even if this is your first time running out a location your location um right like okay well let's figure out these things as they come up and let's figure out how to address them and not like you know hate each other mm-hmm. um you know at the end of day one of a five day shoot or something like that but yeah i i think uh, and i think that was one of i asked jacqueline to share some some thoughts that that she had and and one of hers was make sure everyone is aware of the time and date and i think that means uh employees nope that's the other one let everyone who'll be at the location employees etc know that there will be a shoot happening so everyone's aware of their noise level user role routine could be disrupted go ahead and and book the conference rooms that are in that Mm -hmm. area where something's going to be shot something like that uh give the crew a wide berth or at least know going into it before you commit your location that you're going to 
even if they're only going to be on one half of the office, they're going to end up affecting the whole office. Mm-hmm. A couple other things that uh, have just kind of popped into my head throughout this um, on location, whether it's on location or a uh, soundstage, fees. There's a reason it costs a couple grand to shoot in someone else's office Mm -hmm. because of all the trouble you put them through, because of all the people you require ahead of time to be on site to help with electrical or help with access or help with whatever. You basically need, uh, if you're shooting in an office building of a, of a, not your client and some other, some other company, you need one of their employees to be with you at all times so that you can get through this door or have somebody go ask the maintenance person mm-hmm. or email who's in charge of the meeting rooms. You know, hey, how do we get a key card for the bathroom, right? Yeah. Um, so that fees, you need to consider fees, and it, it, there's a very good reason it costs a lot of money to, to have access to a place like that. Well, and I also think that um, it needs to be clearly stated by the producers but also assumed by the location owner that just because their office hours might be nine to five, a cruise hours are rarely nine to five. Mm -hmm. It's a 6 a.m. call. Mm -hmm. And if it's a 6 a.m. call, that means that they've got to be able to get stuff out of their van, up the elevator, into the office, into the part of the office at 6 Mm a.m. And if the producer hasn't gotten a key card or, or something like that to be able to get access, that means somebody from the company has to be there at 6 a.m. Yep. also. And, you know, uh, film crews are notorious for being on time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and probably the person you're going to ask to go open the doors at 6 a.m. may not be someone who's necessarily notorious for being on time. But guess what? The people who are paying for the video are paying the crew for, for whether they're day. whether they're sitting on the sidewalk waiting for someone to open the doors or they're actually setting up their gear. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're losing money and morale. Yeah, you know I think we've ended up kind of blending some of the tips mm-hmm. for if you're if you're going to host a location here. But that that's part of it is how can you essentially grant 24 hour access to your space you know, with the 10 hour shoot kind of in the middle of that 24 hours. Or if it's a multiple day shoot, um, we were on a shoot once, uh, that was a multiple day shoot and this is the same shoot you weren't on. Uh, it was a multiple day shoot. Uh, it was 6am call times each day. And, um, at the end of lunch on the first day, uh, the our office contact informed us that their chief operating officer or whomever had said that we were going to have to take all the gear out overnight for liability Cleaning? concerns. Oh. Sure. Which, of course, through a little bit of panic through the producers um, until they took a breath. And I think this is one of the biggest key qualities of a producer is like, Manage the panic, yeah. <laughs> breathe, and think what might be right. So in that case, that was the chief operating officer or operations manager or whatever providing a solution, but not identifying the problem. Mm-hmm. The pro- now they had snuck the problem in there. It was liability. Mm-hmm. Have we shared our certificate of insurance with this company that we're renting this space from? No, they never asked for that. Well, why don't we get them a copy of our COI and see if that satisfies their liability concerns? Because if we can't store this stuff overnight, we're going into overtime on crew because now all of a sudden they got to tear everything down. We got to redo our schedules. We got to redo our schedules. We were on a 6 a.m. call time the next morning so that we'd be filming by 7, which means we probably need like a 4.30 call time if we got to take everything out and bring it all back in. We dodged that bullet because we then gave them our COI. They saw what our coverage was. The liability concern was no longer theirs. It was ours. And we got to leave all the gear in overnight, over two nights on a three-day shoot. Mm -hmm. But that would be one of those things that if I were hosting a location for the first time, or if I've just never asked for it before and I've hosted, uh, I've rented out my location multiple times, just go ahead and get a certificate of insurance. Mm Mm-hmm. Even if you don't know what the coverages are, you could probably have your insurance agent or theirs walk you through what the basic coverages mean. And then if you have any legitimate concerns, you at least know that anything happens due to their stuff being here, 
they're responsible, we're not responsible. Yep. Right. So now that's just something that we offer so that we can avoid those situations mm -hmm. and um, any liability concern is transferred to us. And, you know, if the cleaning crew who was in overnight tripped over a light stand or hurt themselves or whatever, we have to take care of that. Mm -hmm. You know, the the space renters don't have to take care of that. Rentees? We work in North Carolina, but when we went to shoot in Vegas, mm. that's a uh, not a right to work state. That is a union state. I, I can't even speak to it from a, an expert's point of view, but like, just know: <laughs> Are you shooting in a if, in a state that is union? If you're not union... used to working with union crews or on union crews or union sets, which we are not, so uh, you know, I think. Doing a brain fart. No. We um, were hired by a client to go out and shoot at one of their pre-conferences. So it was a conference. big industry conference, and they had their own user conference for a couple days beforehand, one day beforehand, whatever it was. They hired us to come out, capture that event, also do some client interviews, things like that. Because it was in Las Vegas, um, the venue has venue told yeah. them basically so. Right, they have to contract through the venue for their AV stuff. That's when all the union stuff starts to come up. And when it came up that there was going to be an independent film crew coming in doing any shooting at all, they said, well, union regulations require that there be a shadow union member for every non-union crew member that's coming in. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking, okay, well, we get twice the crew for... yeah, No. So what this means is there are people who are union dues paying crew members who literally sit near you and have to keep you in like line of sight but they're not supposed to do anything to make sure that you're not doing other jobs that would require another shadow yes our client had to pay the venue for the extra union member shadows for each one of us that ended up on that crew. Somehow it was still cheaper. <laughs> yes. Somehow that was still cheaper than to hiring travel out their there, people to hotels, yes. food, yeah. And, and so we get there and literally one of the dudes is an Elvis impersonator who's just always in character. I mean we did this more than one year, but one of the years this guy just comes in looking like Elvis wearing the black like Yahtzee Union T shirt. And he was the shadow for like our local you know, B-roll capture mm -hmm. guy. And so if the B-roll guy was there, you know, on on sticks, shooting the keynote or whatever, Elvis impersonator in his union t-shirt was just sitting right next to him but not doing anything. Mm -hmm. We had breakout rooms that we had to cover, and union guy would just sit next to each one of the camera and audio people who was monitoring one of those rooms. They just, was wild. they did nothing. They just, so, yeah. I, uh, yes, that is a good one that wasn't on the original list. Is the neighborhood safe? Uh, you, you need to ask yourself that, right? I mean, like parking your cars. Can you park there? Are you going to get your tire stolen? Um, do you, yeah, can you walk around at night and be safe? You, especially if you're the producer, you're liable for the safety of your crew. Yeah. Let's say you're, you're, <clears throat> you've arranged for uh, to shoot in a park. You've got a permit from the city to shoot in the park. Okay. Um, because there's a nice little tuft of trees and you wanted to, yeah, you wanted to shoot there. Uh, great. You've got the certificate or permit and you show up and there's a birthday party in the gazebo next door. Without a permit. And, uh, mm -hmm. and they have an Elvis impersonator and he is singing all day long. And there's a union guy just shadowing him, <laughs> not doing anything. You're like, what is going I think I've heard this before. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, that that strange podcast. <laughs> but, is he always is that Elvis guy? Elvis but forty-seven there? minutes into that weird podcast, I heard somebody talking about an Elvis impersonator not doing anything. And is this what they were talking is. about? No matter where you are, like you said earlier, is construction going on? Being aware of, yeah. Even if you're there scouting at, after hours, so the construction is gone. Is there equipment out? Like you need to be aware of some of these things. Um, looking at community schedules, park schedules. Um, does the office upstairs have its sales kickoff and they're hooting and hollering all day? I seem to recall showing up on a location and all of a sudden there's like, it's like the start stop area for a, 
a five K or something. Uh, I, I mean, I know there was the shoot where we deliberately chose the start stop area, that really rainy shoot. <laughs> um, but but I feel like I can't remember what it was. Um, I'll think about it. We'll just we'll just slowly zoom in on my B camera as I think about what that was. <laughs> there was another shoot we did. It was a multiple day shoot. You weren't on it. Um, where the um, office we were shooting in uh, the day before the first of three shooting days informed us that we had to be out on day three by one o'clock because they were having their holiday party. Oh, I took the call. In their office. <laughs> I was the producer who took the breath on that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so at least that was one where we knew like Monday or Tuesday before a Wednesday through Friday shoot where we had to rearrange our schedule. But um, but when you're playing telephone with the like the locations, the locations representative mm -hmm. and then there's several other people up the chain, they just say, out by two. Oh, yeah, we scheduled something. You kind of touched on it a little bit before. As a producer, how much should I be planning to pay for a location, studio versus, you know, on-site location? Slash, if I'm running out my space, how much should I be prepared to ask for access to my space? I would say there are market rates for some of these uh, some of these things. Let's lowball them all, just in case anybody who we want to rent a location from is listening. We can set an artificially low baseline. Um, I would say it does vary widely. It does. Um, so a sound studio is probably going to be about fifteen hundred a day, and you get the the ten hour time slot basically, yeah. um, and the, because the studio's got to have somebody there, um, etc. Yeah, and it's, you know, but again, you're and getting then it, a... And then if you want access to VO booths and producer's offices and sure. these things, then it probably costs more. Yeah, and sometimes that's... And you get you get a, um, a break room for Crafty. You get this large bathroom to also do hair and makeup. Like, some of that stuff may come with it, yeah. and then there are additional yeah. options. Um, you know, I've seen it as low as seven fifty a day yep. for a studio, but it may Some be one that smaller. has that's a photography studio, and you've got to spend that extra time, and perhaps gaffer money, uh, blacking out those windows. Sure. Right. So, I mean, there there's always a trade off there. What about, um, what about an office or a private residence or yeah, something like that? I would Ooh, say we haven't even touched on private residence no. as much, other than your house. Most of the time, you're looking to shoot in something that looks nice. Right, visually stimulating, and it, but if it fits the story, whatever. Yeah. Um, if it's if you're just house. going to it, let's say a neighbor's house and say, hey, can we shoot here for the day? I mean, they've got to bring in cleaners as a courtesy. They probably will, um, or they'll want to. If they've got kids, they've got to figure out what they're going to do with them. If they work from home, there's a lot of considerations. So, so yeah, I'd, I'd say like two thousand twenty five hundred bucks to rent out someone's home for the day is pretty fair. And that's that's hard cost. There's no margins that the producers get from something like that. Right. No. 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 Um, so, th like, that's how videos get expensive. Um, so that yeah, from a residence standpoint, I'd say two thousand is a is a f fair number. You could probably get a decent house for for two grand. Mm -hmm. Now, you could also talk somebody into giving you access to their house for two hundred fifty dollars. Sure. Right. I mean, part of this is. That's why you get good producers. <laughs> yeah, the, part of that is what producers can do. Part of that is is whether you're finding a place that has a history of being a location for things. Yeah, a lot of states and their their film uh, units or whatever yeah. they're called film commissions. Film commissions will have lists of locations that have been which I've used. I've found to be woefully out of date and oftentimes crowdsourced, and so eighty yeah. percent of those lists are often just outdated. We've found homes through Airbnb or VRBO where we've had the opportunity to rent the space for 250 300 500 dollars a day something like mm -hmm. that um, and they're already used to having it as a, as a space where people are in so maybe they're you know they're used to having it cleaned on a regular basis mm -hmm. it's usually empty it's maybe a you know uh, uh, it, whether it's a house to itself or or it's a you know furnished uh, room over a garage or whatever it is, um, it's not part of their living space. 
Um, and then we've had we've been in homes that have been uh, used in multiple photography shoots and and some film and video shoots where they know what they're doing and they do throw that you know twenty five hundred dollar a day number at you and mm-hmm. you thought oh well we lived in the same neighborhood I thought you would give me the neighborhood right mm-hmm. um, and then you get in and they're walking you through the space and. They know what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, well, not going to save any money here. Um, I think that leads us into maybe where to find locations. Uh, I've come up with a list of places that we've often used. Um, so Airbnb, VRBO. Mm-hmm. Um, Those are great because they are they are they do a lot of the visual scouting for you. Yes, is, you know, is this in the right location? Is what? How much is this going to cost? Just a flat rate and. Um, and what does it look like? Well, and, and we've, we've done multiple videos where, uh, we needed the aesthetics to be a certain way. Uh, the interior design, the look of the kitchen, whatever, uh, certain colors, certain, uh, you know, maybe more, uh, traditional farmhouse than like modern or contemporary. Well, Airbnb and VRBO are very well set up to give you photos of every room, multiple angles in every room, and be able to, without having to actually go to a location, see if it fits Mm -hmm. the vibe you're looking for. And then because a lot of those people are used to having that as an income stream, they're used to having it as a place that they don't necessarily live in themselves primarily or... They're used to renting out to guests. They're used. They have a company set up to clean it after every use. Whatever, I, we've found them more open to and right. more flexible to renting out those spaces than you know someone we might have a personal connection with, or might just be someone in our personal or business network, or somebody yeah. who knows somebody who knows somebody. But part of it is just of. expectations of there are going to be strangers here. There are. Um, I'm not going to be staying here tonight. Um, yeah. And just. That makes it easier for them. Yeah. Um, also, if you are looking to shoot some of those, the fact that you don't, they don't have to send in a crew to change bed sheets and stuff like that. They mm-hmm. make you, you can oftentimes negotiate a deal. Yeah. So that they don't, you don't have to pay all the fees and whatnot. Yep. And I don't know. There's something cool about those locations. Like the, I don't know. They, they. I guess maybe it's just the ones we find, but they tend to have these little personality things built into them where maybe you bring in, yeah, and you bring a little, they have a lived in nest to them that like even if you paid a set construction crew to build a fake kitchen, it wouldn't have that same kind of like lived in feel Mm -hmm. or there are these little, and you can bring in things. I mean, you could easily go to Target or at home or whatever, buy some tchotchkes, right? Decorate the areas however you want it in there but i mean some of them come with so much of that stuff already there Mm -hmm. and of course check with the homeowner to make sure that you can move things around Mm -hmm. on the wall or or whatever um i don't know i like i like shooting in places that we find on airbnbs Mm -hmm. another play another way that we found some locations is we've done a lot of work with uh commercial development firms and so they either have vacant buildings which can be like a, just a shell space which can be which kind can of be a unique yep. look um or at least have uh some model type rooms kind of set up to to show what this building could look like or even just to start getting photography options for to sell the place for marketing anyhow um they have a good idea of what's available and what's not yeah. within the city yeah and and they have brokers uh, too uh, which, yeah and they have the network where they know if there's a half vacant office that somebody's trying to, you know, uh, without having put it on the market, sublease half of their space, and uh, you know, due to a downsizing or remote work or whatever it is, that may not be something that is. And this is what I was going to bring up next: is LoopNet is essentially the commercial real estate version of Zillow or I guess even Airbnb, whatever. So LoopNet is where you find commercial real estate listings. So if you don't know any commercial real estate agents or brokers, anybody like that, you could start on LoopNet, maybe look for sublease spaces, look for uh, anything that's available for lease. You're probably not going to find up-to-date pictures like you're going to find on Airbnb. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're from like multiple tenants ago. Um, But it lists the broker or agent information on those pages and you can certainly reach out and 
especially if it's a sublease. I mean, the company that is trying to get rid of that space is responsible for paying that rent mm-hmm. until someone else comes in. So if they can capture two a grand for a yeah. day or a grand or five grand for a week or whatever, I'm sure they'd take that, cover a month of rent or half a month of rent or whatever yep. it is to, you know, uh, to get them a little bit further along until they find their next real tenant. So uh, oftentimes very motivated there. Also in the <clears throat> commercial real estate world, uh, we found that, and it's because we've had some agreements with them in the past, but we found WeWorks and some of those like shared space offices mm-hmm. uh, to be, they, they, there's more hoops to jump through. You have to fill out forms and talk yep. to home office and everything, but um, send insurance. But a lot of times they're open to it and they're, they're pretty reasonable in terms of price or free, mm-hmm. we found, depending on your relationships with them. Yeah. Property management companies, for me, that's more of a, you know, residential type thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you aren't contacting somebody through Airbnb or VRBO, these are places where you could go because they know the houses that are available to rent short term while also and what's vacant. What's pretty cool uh, about them, uh, maybe not property management, but um, <clears throat> real estate uh, company, like commercial or um, residential real estate. What's the right word for it? Not broker, but the Agent? people, agents. Um, they will have, those firms will have staging, like a whole warehouse full of staging mm-hmm. stuff. Yep. And so they, you, you could probably rent a whole kitchen's worth of, of furnishings for like a couple hundred bucks. And we've tried to secure model homes in new developments as a location. Mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. think we've been successful with it, but they were, some were open to it. But yeah. some were open to it. Yeah. Right. And that's, Right, if they can, if if they've got three or four different models of the slightly different versions, sure, for fifteen hundred bucks, they could close one down one day in the middle of the week where they don't get much traffic anyway, and there you go, fully staged and mm-hmm. you know, uh, brand new residential location. Uh, you mentioned film commissions; they seem less and, and less relevant. Yeah. Day by day. Yeah. A locations Hub is one I found um, that I kind of always forget about, and then I hear about it, and I'm like, ooh, a new place to find location. But it's basically kind of an aggregator of film commission sites. I've, and I've seen some, and they may be more local uh, and regional, but I uh, found some some that are like Airbnb, but for, for filming specifically. Mm-hmm. And so, but I feel like they pop up and disappear and pop yeah. up and disappear. So just... It's worth Googling to see what might be out there. One last little section here. Let everyone who will be at the location know that there will be a shoot happening. So everyone's aware of their noise level and their usual routine could be disrupted. Uh, Make sure everyone is aware of time date so that any paperwork, COIs, NDAs, etc. can be taken care of beforehand. Yeah, that. uh, so that's a direct result of, of the one, you know, day one where they asked us to remove all of our gear. And we're like, well, what if we... Yeah. Listed you as a lost payee on our well, the NDA is insurance. important too because if you're sharing like privileged market information um, from for your tech clients, but you're at some other company yeah. filming inside that office, the NDA might need to carry over into your location. Yeah, so. and you might see um, uh, you might see protected information on the whiteboard of the lo- of the location sure. that you're shooting at, and so yep. you may need an NDA with. The location. And, oh, so this is a good one. This is kind of the Boy Scout rule. Um, Be prepared for your space to be moved, changed around, but also know that it will be put back into its proper place if you have a good crew. I think we always... We take pictures before we we do anything. We, you know, we follow the principle of, like, this space will be cleaner and more organized when we leave than Mm -hmm. when we found it. Yep. Um, And you build a reputation off of that. I mean... Yeah. Film crews and producers, especially, are are very cognizant of that, and will do a good job for the most part to to pick that stuff up and make it make it right. And as a producer, it is always a good rule to go ahead and ask first before sure. doing those kinds of things. Hey, can we move this conference table? Can we take this thing off the wall? You know, those kinds of things. I feel like we should put together like a little like checklist that could be printed off if somebody wanted to, you know. Go to a location, like get a location for the first time. Here's the things you need to look for. Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll write like a blog post or something about it. Check back with us. Yeah. Jake, did you get that? Did you hear that? Blog post on, ooh, how about like a an ebook or a guide? Yes. Yeah, something downloadable so we can capture leads capture from other leads. producers. Yeah. 
having backups is a really good idea, especially if you're working with people who are not used to offering their location as a location. Because even if they're not intending to say, oh, actually, you can't shoot here, uh, which may happen, they also may have, oh, our, our plumber's coming in to get this thing taken care of today, and it just, that cannot. Or, or if you're shooting in a house and the plumbing blows up, mm-hmm. you're going to need a new place to shoot. So that's a great idea. Have a backup. No matter what, uh, call sheets usually have this as a, a, a thing uh, to put yes. on it, but know where the know where the the closest hospital is emergency room if there is an issue you people need to be able to go they need to be able to go to that call sheet and know exactly where to go yeah. plug it into their phone and get to the hospital it's never happened on our set but it it's inevitably going to happen at some point somebody you know a gaffer loses their finger or something take us home ben we good yeah we good okay yeah so if you're looking for a location in a studio on location Uh, wherever it may be the key things as a producer to look out for are lighting control audio control subset of audio control is hvac control but there's also that temperature part of it Mm -hmm. um you got to know that you got enough power um you've um got to and, and i think the sound control comes down to interior and exterior sound control like lawn mowers and leaf blowers and whatever else may be going on there making sure that you've got access to get all the gear where it needs to be you don't have to go up four steps with a cart because those things are so heavy and you know in most public spaces with with ada regulations and whatever there should be ramp accessibility elevators things like that but you know make sure make sure there's enough room to stage gear to stage crew uh to eat lunch, all those things, your your production footprint is going to be much bigger than you think it is or much bigger than the person renting you their space <laughs> thinks it might be. If you're on location and it's an office and people are working there or if it's a retail place and, and people are shopping there, um, you are not the number one priority. Uh, you have to make room for uh that company's employees that company's customers so that they can continue to do business but hopefully you've planned enough in advance to mitigate any uh crossover or make sure that you've got the right kind of access or spaces certificates of insurance are always nice to have uh plan for every contingency talk it over with the owner of the location I think just setting expectations of knowing something's yep. going to go wrong yep and um, trying to figure out how to how to work with it yep I think we sprinkled in some some tips for people who have maybe either rented out their location before or thinking about uh, that as an opportunity. How to be a good host, what to expect. There's probably more to it than, um, and honestly, there could be more to it than your producer is. Uh, if they aren't properly managing expectations, there there's a it's going to have an impact on your day to day operations. It just is. But having the right location is so often the fundamental piece of, of shooting video. So uh, get creative. Um, push boundaries. Look for new opportunities. Don't always just settle for the conference room or, you know, whatever space is available in your office or your client's office. Because um, oftentimes, you know, even just moving a block down the road can make all the difference and get a really interesting looking location that's more engaging or more suited for whatever it is you're making. Mm-hmm. I found that a lot of times too in the, in the scouting process, you can find inspiration in yeah. for the, for the creative. So yeah. just kind of roll with it. Yeah. All right. Uh, and again, another thanks. Did you want to check? Did we, have we heard from our sponsor? <sighs> can we do this tomorrow? He's saying, no, we cannot. So no, we'll put it in the show notes, I guess. Procrastinate.nation. Yep. Yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah, thanks for joining. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, that was this episode of the Video Reformation Podcast. We'll catch you next time where we'll be talking about the next thing. Something else. <laughs>